Everybody, before I get started, I do want to share a bit of a testimony with you. Uh, when we began this church, we brought Chief Joe Hill, and then we honored him for his leadership uh, over our police department. Uh, he will retire uh, on August, of, I'm sorry, October the 4th. October the 4th, he'll retire. And so we'll, we'll need your prayers concerning who our next chief will be because these uh, men and women have been charged with our care and our protection, and we don't want to take that for granted. That's right. right. So we want to be prayerful about that. Now, in light of that, uh, I've been given the responsibility of serving as a police chaplain. And uh, this past week, as you know, storms come through, and most of the rain, I think, hit North Carolina. But for those of you that aren't familiar with this region, what happens is that water that, stay, that, that lands in, South, in no, sorry, North Carolina, it flows down into South Carolina. And it takes about seven or 10 days for that to happen. So long after the storm is over and we've gone on with life, flooding is happening in our community. And so the police department has taken extensive steps, not only the police, but fire, our government, your elected officials have taken uh, tremendous efforts in stopping the floodwaters in a region of Horry County called Bucksport. Bucksport, um, historically, uh, was uh, an area occupied by uh, uh, freed slaves. And so uh, these slaves were freed and they were put not on the best of the earth, but they were given swamp land to live in. And so over the, over the years, they've made a community there, but the challenge is, is that it's always flooded when storms happen. And the, the, our, our government has been trying to figure out how do we fix that so that stops. And so over this past week, uh, about 750 truckloads of dirt was sent into Bucksport to raise up a, a road that the, the, the engineers thought would stop the water that came from North Carolina. And so I was asked uh, by one of the deputy chiefs, hey, would you get in the car with me? We're gonna go down to Bucksport. And so we did, and uh, there was a, a room of officials in there, and he said, would you please pray for us? Would you please pray for our safety? Would you please pray that what the government is doing will work? And uh, no small thing. So we asked the Lord, not only that, that their plan would work, but that the, the, the flood waters would come to nothing. Amen. Well, the, the last report I received, no flooding in Bucksport. Lord. For that, uh, I'm thankful for our government. I'm thankful for our first responders. Mostly, I'm thankful to our God yes. that he answered our prayers. And don't miss this. You have a government official that says, would you come in and pray? Amen. Would you come in and pray in the name of Jesus for us? Amen. Our God is faithful. Now, I, I took a moment, please allow me that moment to bring you up to date because you are the folks that are living here. You are the folks that are praying. You are the folks that are believing, but you never hear about the works of God, only the works of man. Our God, he's moving on our behalf. He's moving in this community and he wants to show himself strong. We want to believe him for that. We want to thank him for that. Amen. Today, as we, we've got a couple of weeks left, as we were, uh, we've been in a kind of a freestyle series. Uh, I believe Pastor D is, is up next week to preach the word. Uh, and so we're excited about that. I'm, I'm excited about what God has given for me to share with you today. I think that Pastor Donnell, I think that Elder Ron were all in my sermon. I don't appreciate them looking over my shoulder. 
and looking at my, my, my scriptures, but I'm thankful that God is emphasizing his word to us today. Yeah. Today, we're going to be looking at, uh, or we're going to be talking about the righteousness of God. We'll begin over in Romans 3, but I'm not, I, I just want to, I want to lay some groundwork, okay? So let's go to Romans 3. I'm going to start at verse 23 and go through verse 26. Verse 23. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified as a gift by the grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished. Verse 26. For the demonstration that is of his righteousness at the, the, uh, at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. This is the word of our God that we'll look at today. The righteousness of God. Now, let me begin by apologizing to you, and in some ways, maybe even repenting. Because we as believers, we go into the world and God commands us to preach the gospel. I'm, I'm not sure that we do a good job about that. I'm not sure that we follow the command of God and preach the gospel as we should. Mm -hmm. Now, before I go forward, I may also give you a caution that if you're wearing open toe shoes, sandals, or you need to raise your feet, please do now. It is not my intent to step on your feet, but it's my intent to inspire you to do all that God has created you to do. Yeah. It costs God all that he loved for us. And he did it unashamedly. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking about that. As I say that I apologize and repent for our failed efforts to fulfill the will of God by preaching this gospel, we talk about God in ways that really he doesn't. We go into the world and we tell people, God loves you. You know, God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you, and God is love. And for unbeliever, for unbeliever, there's a disconnect because we never really talk about the God that, uh, that they might even believe. They have many questions. How is God God, yet he's a God of judgment and he's a God of mercy? He's a God that destroys, yet he is a God that brings life. He's a God of war. And yet, he's a God of peace. There is a disconnect in the minds of men and women about who God is. Yet, the gospel really doesn't emphasize his love. The gospel emphasizes his righteousness. And we really don't talk about it like we should. Today, it is my hope that it's the responsibility of this leadership team to train you and to prepare you for the work of the ministry. This is what today is. It is my hope that when you leave here, the testimony that comes out of your mouth is both gospel and it preaches the truth about the nature of who our God is, the fact that he is righteous. The world's misunderstanding about who the God of the Bible is will be cleared up 
as we move forward in these truths. The world has many questions about our God. Well, if God is God, and there are people that say, I don't believe in God, there are people who say, ah, I'm not sure that there's a God at all. And there's a people that say, I believe in God, I believe in God. Yeah, but what God? Because there are many. There's one true and living God. There's one God of the Bible. There's one God Almighty, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. That's the God that I'm presenting to you today because our failure to do that would cause somebody to stumble. God, if you're God, why did my loved one die? Why did my friend die? Pastor D and I, we lost our second baby. We were a young couple in love with one another, in love with the idea of family, and in love with God. How in the world would a loving God allow for us to lose our baby? Hmm. How would a loving God allow for us to be molested, both boys and girls? Why would a loving God, you fill in the blank, it's a struggle, y'all. And when we go out into the world and we begin to talk to the world about a God of love, there's a disconnect because they go, well, if he loved me, he wouldn't let this happen to me. The challenge is the love is by our own definition and not his own. God is righteous. We're going to talk about what this is, righteousness. But I want you to know that the God of the Bible, he's always right. Somebody didn't hear me. So here we go. I want you to, I want you to say, just look at me. Don't look around. Just look at me and say, the God of the Bible, God of the Bible. is always right. Always. All right, now look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. The, God the, the God of the Bible is always right. Always right. Now, finally, look down at your, at your flesh. <laughs> look down at your flesh and go, flesh, flesh. The, God the, the God of the Bible, he's always right. No, 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 I'm hoping that I can get through this, this sermon without, time, without crying. He's always right. One of the commands that God gave to the children of Israel, one of the Ten Commandments, the ninth one was, does anybody remember? Do not bear false witness. The God of this world, not the God of the Bible, the God of this world is Satan. Is Satan. Everything that he does is a lie. Yeah. Everything that he does is untrue. Everything that he does is unholy. Everything that he does. And he wants you to blame God for the situations that we live in. The God of the Bible is always right. This world, different story. Who's in leadership? Different story. The excellent candidates that you and I get to choose from to make our president in 2024? <laughs> the God of the Bible is always right. Man does stuff that man does. And we want to blame God. You say, God, do something. He did. He sent the world us. 
He sent the world to us. And he said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Baptize people. And then teach them how to obey me. If you're not doing that, today I want it to stop. And I don't mean be weird. I don't mean everybody you talk to. You've got to ambush them. You've got to kidnap them. You've got to lock them in a room and say, if you don't believe Jesus, you're not getting out. That's plain wrong, weird, and criminal. Don't do that. But you can, you can pour your life into the life of someone who's lost, who's lonely, and who feels left out. And you can, you can introduce to them the God of the Bible. And they'll love him. And he'll pursue them. And he'll draw them to himself. And their lives will forever be changed. We talked about months ago from Ephesians 6 about the, 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 the whole armor of God and how God wants us as believers to put on his whole armor. And I just want to highlight two of those things as we go out. He said, the helmet of salvation, meaning the, the, the knowledge, the thing that we crown our head in, is the, is the remembrance that Jesus Christ died for us. It's the remembrance that I'm not lost. It's the remembrance that the grave doesn't have me. That in him... I'm going to have life. That's what we're crowned in. How many of you go out to work and you crown yourself with the knowledge that you are born again believer, son or daughter of God? Or do you just get up like it's a routine? I got to go again. Here I go. He says, no, no, no. Put on the whole armor of God. And then he said, breastplate of righteousness that you walk out and your heart is secure in the knowledge that my God is always right regardless of what I face regardless of what I see regardless of what my circumstances are my God he's always right you need to be armored in that because why? Because the world will try to tell you differently. And it's striking your chest and it's striking your heart and it's striking your life. And you're going, God, where are you? And he's going, I'm right here. These truths from Romans 3. How can we attain these things? When if you go up a little further, right around verse 11, he says, there is none righteous. There's none good, not even one. There's no one who understands, and there's no one who seeks after God. Hmm. Pastor, I thought you were going to talk to us about what it means to be righteous. Yet the Bible says, there's none. How can we ever be the people that, he, that, that are required to have relationship with the God of the Bible? How can that be when he says there's none good, yeah. there's none righteous, there's none that think the way that I think, there's none that understand the way that I understand, there's none that do the way that they should. None means nobody so regardless of my title, regardless of how long I've been coming to church, regardless of who my mom and them are, there's none. None. I think that the God of the Bible is masterful in how he teaches us. I want to highlight from Romans 3, 21 through 23, where it talks about 
and fall short of the glory of God? My wife's favorite translation, the Amplified Version, says continually fall short. It's not something that you do once. It's something you do all the time. Every time we open our eyes, we miss the mark. Every time we try to do the right thing, it doesn't work out kind of the way we hoped that it would. And what hope is there for us, y'all? If we're continually missing the mark, if we don't seek God, if there's none that, that do good, if there are none that are righteous, if all that's true, then what hope is there for us? We'll get there. Let me begin by, saying, by uh, giving you a working definition from Merriam-Webster. The dictionary writes, Righteousness is acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt, free from sin. So if God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is Merriam-Webster right or wrong? Our God is always right. You see, if we go by this definition, then we, 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 we are continually subject to being beat up by the enemy who says, you're not born again, you're not a daughter of God, you're not a son of God, you can't possibly measure up to who you need to be because Today, you've already made five mistakes. And the enemy will name them for you. He goes even further. He'll begin to compare you with other people. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's just no way. How can you be a wife like Pastor Donnell? She's perfect. Pastor Donnell don't think the way you think. She don't talk the way you talk, and she don't act the way you act, and she don't treat her husband the way you treat me. Hmm. And if you believe that lie, then you're constantly in your corner, constantly feeling beat up, constantly feeling incompetent, constantly feeling like there's no hope for you. So then why try? Why walk out this life the way that, that God has commanded if it's something, it's something that you can't attain. It's something that you can't acquire. Be careful. The Bible says righteousness. Here's the, uh, here's the Greek word. I'm going to spell it. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. Dikaiosune. D-K-A-S-N-A. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. In the broadest of senses, the state of him who is as he ought to be, a condition acceptable to God. In areas of integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. When our Bible talks to us about being righteous, this is his expectation. This is the word of our God. Our God deals with us, deals with believers righteously and in, accord, in accordance to his covenant promises. God deals with the believer righteously and according to his covenant promises. We need to understand that about our God because his command for us is to live and to do a certain thing in a certain way. Now, in the beginning, God is creating things. He creates man. And after he creates all, all of that, he looks at the creation, he looks at man and he says all of it is good all of it is good except it is not good that man should be alone 
And so he caused Adam to fall asleep. He pulled a rib from his body. He formed a woman, and he brought the woman to Adam, and the two became one. Adam says, whoa, man. <laughs> this bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Hmm. Well, he goes about being a husband, and he misses the mark in certain areas because he should have been caring for her. He should have been guarding the garden when he did not. But anyway, the enemy gets in there, and the enemy begins to talk to his wife. And theologians believe that Adam was standing right there. Uh, husbands, you ought to guard your wife in such a way that when the enemy comes up against her, don't you stand there. You drive that enemy far away. Anyway, Adam did. He allowed for the conversation to happen. Eve is deceived. Then he follows along with his wife. They eat the fruit in violation of God's command. Now they know that they're naked and they hide themselves. They not only hide themselves, but they cover themselves naked. So I'm going to cover myself. This is how y'all look. You cover your sin. To cover your sin is never quite efficient enough because depending on what angle you stand or how you try to cover, somebody, somebody's sin is going to be exposed. You should laugh because that's how you look. When you try to hide from God, when you try to hide your sin, I don't want nobody to see. Listen, when I was growing up, we had basements. And we went down the basement and we turned off the lights. And sin happened. Whatever it was. Because nobody wants to sin in the light. But my mama would come down there with her stick of adjustment and she'd turn that light on and she'd start a swinging. Or people in my generation, I'm not going to pick on the younger folks, but people in my generation. Do you remember when you was down in the basement and somebody would accidentally turn the lights on? Turn that off! Why? Because you're trying to hide your sin. Not only did they try to hide their sin, but they hid from God. Our God pursued them. Adam, where are you? No matter what your mistake is, the God of the Bible pursues you. He pursues you to have a relationship with you. He pursues you because he cares. He pursues you because he wants you to be made right with him. You run. You hide. You cover. God, when he realized, or when they realized what they had done, God said, okay. He meets out the consequences of their actions. An innocent animal is then sacrificed. And then God clothes them in the skin of an animal. Maybe, maybe you'll get it on the way home. M man covers his sin. God clothes you so no, no matter which way you turn no matter what angle anybody's looking you are clothed in him now that animal was a type of Christ the animal did nothing wrong 
but the animal had to shed its blood for their sin. For without the shedding of blood, sin is not forgiven. Sin costs a blood sacrifice. Man covered, God clothed. Hmm. And then understanding and receiving that which God has clothed you in. We're getting there, y'all. That thing that God has clothed you in, he wants you to embrace it. He wants you to receive it. He wants you to have it. How do we get there? By a belief in what we've already read, Jesus Christ. You see, Abraham believed the Lord. And the Lord counted it to Abraham as righteousness. In order to be clothed in the righteousness that God wants to clothe you in, you must believe in Jesus. So your righteousness is locked in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ on the cross Mm -hmm. and the gospel message of who he is. So when God says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, people are struck with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> on their behalf. And when they believe that, righteousness closed their life. No longer covered, clothed. Another big word as we close. This big word, propitiation. Hmm. Propitiation. This propitiation takes on two meanings or two, there there are two uh, accomplishments of Christ's work on the cross on our behalf. It appeases the wrath of God. And? It reconciles us to God. Someone has to give, someone has to pay for my sin and yours. Someone has to do that. It just doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it doesn't happen, hear me the right way, it doesn't happen because God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have life everlasting. You must believe in order that you might receive, in order that you might be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ's work on the cross on your behalf. And that, ladies and gentlemen, makes you righteous. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so, it's not the work that I do. It's what Christ has done. It's not, hey, you messed up. You're going to hell. It's not, you missed the mark. You're going to hell. It's, no, 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 I believe. And Christ's work on the cross has justified me, has brought me back into right relationship with the God of the Bible. And it's that covenant, (coughs) 
It's that relationship. It's that shed blood. It's that covenant, if you will, that God deals with us out of. Not out of our own works. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this, not of your own doing. This is a gift of God and not of works. <coughs> to be justified, to render righteous, to render righteous, to show, to exhibit, to events, E-V-I-N-C-E, that means revealed presence or feeling. One to be righteous, such as he, <clears throat> such as he is and wishes himself to be considered, to declare, to pronounce, one to be just, righteous, or such as he ought to be. In order for you to be who you ought to be in God, it requires your belief, like your brother Abraham, your belief in Jesus Christ and in his sacrifice for you, for us. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the good news. This is the gospel. And when we sit in our seats silently, when we stay at home, when we don't go into our communities, and when we don't preach the Bible, we are not responding as believers. Because the only thing that would keep you silent about a truth that you know is that you really don't believe. Because if we really believed, we would take somebody, we would share with somebody, we would drag somebody in here, we would tie them to a chair, we would say, you need to encounter the true and living God. If we really believed, when we go into our workspaces, when we go out into our communities, we would best reflect the God of the Bible and his great love for us. For we know where God has brought us from. Other folks who can't see in the dark, they don't quite know where you've come from. But you know because you were there. You know what God has brought you from. So when you go out and witness, it's not necessary for you to have every scripture and verse at the tip of your tongue. It's really not. What's more important or, or just as important as that is that you do have a testimony for which you can witness. Let me just tell you how I witness how God saved me. I witness how, how God brought me through. I witness as to how God healed me. I witness as to how God, fill in the blank. I'm a witness. And when you witness, nobody can argue that about what you've experienced one to one. They might say, oh, I disagree. You can disagree all you want to. I walked it. I lived it. I know it. Been there, done that. Now, as we go, you have been made righteous by the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Thank you, Lord. You, you can go ahead and celebrate that. What I don't want you to do is I don't want you to limit yourself and I don't want you to limit others by holding yourself to such a standard that you cannot achieve. The only way that we can live life rightly is through Jesus Christ. If you rely on man, 
Man's going to make you feel this way on Monday, but I guarantee you on Friday you'll feel another way. Oh, I thought you loved me. I, I, I thought we was friends. I thought you was going to be fill in the blank. No, no, no. That's a man. That's a woman. No, no, no. My wife, years ago, she said, Sean, uh, I, I, I just want to be able to believe you for A, B, C, and D. And my retort to her was, sweetie, please don't do that. The moment that you believe me for those things, I'll fail you. But if you believe God, I'm going to be okay. What did it do? It freed her up. She doesn't have to worry, what's that dude doing now? What's he doing now? What's going on now? What's going to happen now? What's tomorrow look like? I don't know. No, no, no. Our God, he's got us. He loves us. He gave his only begotten for us. And if we'll receive the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, the Holy Spirit will come in and the Holy Spirit will help us live this life out the right way and be the righteous people that God has commanded us to be. You can put your feet down now. Thank you. Let's go out, family, and be righteous sons and daughters of God.